Hello, 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 and welcome to BSB Preview. My name is Sandy Lowe. I am Bold Strokes Book Senior Editor, and I have an amazing panel of authors with me. Um, as we were just saying before we went live, this month is the month of the multi-author books. So we're going to have a very packed BSB Preview, which I am super excited about. All right, to start us off, I have our opening question. And that is, who is the biggest supporter of your writing? Jean, why don't we start with you? Who is the biggest supporter of your writing? Okay, well, I'm coming to you from the Carol Brady slot of the Brady Bunch thing right here. <laughs> um, and I would have to say that my cousin Carolyn is my biggest supporter, um, but also I have so many friends that are just always, you know, always there for me. So I, I, I have a lovely group of biggest supporters. Uh, hmm, let's see. How about Amanda across the pond? Oh, thanks, Jean. Um, my biggest supporter is uh, definitely my wife, Emma. Um, but I also have like readers who have been with me from the start from when I sort of first first was writing. So there's uh, Carol and Mira and people like that who uh, have always been there. And it's just really nice to have them sort of on the journey. Um, let's go over to Florida and, and ask Erin. Um, I would say my biggest supporter, aside from Jackie and Jean, <laughs> would probably be Gail. Uh, my, um, I mean, she's not my wife, but she basically is my wife. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, she is there for me through all of the ups and the, all the downs. <laughs> so it's, yeah, she's, she's a rock. So, uh, let's go to, uh, Jackie. <laughs> um my biggest supporter is probably my wife Alexis just because of the amount of time that she has to sacrifice for me to write and we have a toddler so that can be kind of um difficult at times so as far as day-to-day -day support it would be Lex for sure and then um whenever I get stuck on something it's it, it's Jane and Aaron that I go to for stuff when Aaron tells me not to kill people off and you know, Jean says, go for it. So I have to pick which one I'm going to go to for what. Yeah. Uh, let's go to VK. Okay. Um, probably my biggest supporters are my two beta readers who stick with me no matter what, no matter how bad it is. <laughs> they stick with me. And then I have some religious readers who read everything from day one and they continue to stick with me. So those in addition to some friends, you know, that are always there. Okay, Frizz? Ah, I think my number one supporter without question is my wife, Kathy. Uh, I don't know where I'd be without her and her patience. It seems to, it's endless. Um, the ideas that we bounce around and she puts up with all kinds of crazy ideas and uh, the time constraints the um, just the generosity, just a spirit to keeps me going and uh, inspires me in, in so many ways. Everybody should be so lucky. Huh. Let me see who we got left. Kristen. Um, I would have to say my husband, Brad, because he has to listen to me talk about my ideas 24 seven. He's stuck <laughs> with me and he lives with me and he has no choice. <laughs> And um, my two friends, Weston and Kat, who have been there forever and are my biggest cheerleaders. So probably Brad, Weston and Kat. And um, saving the best for last, uh, Alyssa. <laughs> your turn, babe. Yeah, you stole my answer. Uh, I was gonna say your husband too. <laughs> <laughs> um, my wife, Courtney, um, I also have a toddler. And so someone who's willing to um, watch a toddler single-handedly is really wonderful. Um, and then also my writing partner, Kristen, obviously. And then Aaron, have you gone? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was like, oh, again. You but know I, was, me. <laughs> I didn't know if anyone was brave enough to pronounce my name or try to pronounce my name. <laughs> Before I get it wrong, is it Alyssa? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Has, has everyone gone? I wasn't paying attention, but you knew that. Okay, 
Awesome. All right. Well, as you guys know, this is a reading panel. We are reading from our June 2021 releases, which are available for pre-order and will be out in just about a week. Um, I did pop the link in the chat roll. So if you would like 15% off any of these books tonight, please click that link and include the coupon code PREVIEW15. Okay, we are going to start with Jean, who is reading from Swift Vengeance that she wrote with Jackie D and Aaron Zach. Actually, Aaron's doing the reading. Aaron's doing the reading. I apologize. <laughs> Unless You're you want us all to read from it, uh, you know, we, we will. <laughs> I can go for, do you want me to go first then? Yeah, let's do it. All right, cool. Right on. All right, all right. if everyone else can um, mute and stop their video. Ooh, everyone's filing out. All right, <laughs> so I will explain a little bit about Swift Vengeance. So this is a um, a threesome, <laughs> well, not really, but we wrote this together, Jackie, Jean, and myself. And it is, um, we took a secondary character from one of our books and uh, made it a main character in this book. So I took Tony from Breaking Down Our Walls, uh, Jackie took Brittany from um, uh, Land's End and I, uh, Jean took um, Alice and Leslie instead of Alice's point of view, it's Leslie's point of view from um, the second wave. So we wanted to kind of shine some light on our secondary characters and let them, um, you know, have the, have the spotlight. So I'm going to kind of, I don't want to say jump around, but I am going to jump a little bit because I wanted to read a little bit from um, kind of each point of view uh, from Tony's, from Brittany's, and from um, this one isn't Leslie's point of view, but it, it is Alice's, but it just showcases obviously Jean very well and showcases Jackie and then showcases myself. So this happens right uh, when Brittany gets to town, uh, to Swift Island, and um, she's been, she came there basically because she's been having these visions and she, um, gets there, she's hungry, she's thirsty, she goes into this bar, the second wave, for a beverage and a bite to eat, and uh, she meets Tony, and this is from Tony's point of view. How's it going up there, Tony? Tony sighed as she leaned against the countertop in the back of the pub. The bar top is pretty busy. I was totally getting checked out by a new chick in town, too. Oh? Leslie walked over to the door to see out to the restaurant. Is she cute? Auntie, Tony said softly, I'm so not in the right place to even be thinking about that. Leslie gasped as she peered through the window of the door. Honey, is that her? She looked over her shoulder at Tony. She's gorgeous. Leslie gasped. Ugh, sorry. Oh my God. Seriously? Tony pushed away from the counter and breezed past her aunt. Stop, please. Okay, fine. I'm just saying. It feels nice to be looked at every now and then, doesn't it? Tony rolled her eyes. No. She was lying. It actually felt really good. And her aunt was right. The woman at the bar was beautiful. It wasn't like it hurt to let someone else melt her ice cold heart just a little bit. Not a full defrost setting on a microwave, but at least a little thawing. She pus pushed past her aunt and went back behind the bar. A few customers needed refill, so she got to work pouring brew after brew. Her first pour of the day two days ago was the worst pour on record, according to Aunt Alice. But now she was borderline expert. No head and a clean pour every time. Except, of course, when she knew someone was watching her and she felt the weight of that new woman's eyes on her the entire time she was behind the bar. Being looked at was something Tony had dealt with for most of her life. It didn't bother her most of the time. Heck, it wasn't bothering her at that moment either. She kind of liked it. But liking something that was supposed to make her feel good so quickly after handing her heart over to Penn seemed like the wrong thing to do. Pen threw your heart right back to you, though, didn't she? <sighs> Would you like another? Tony flitted over to the new brunette customer. Her head was down as she feverishly scribbled notes into a spiral notebook. She slapped the notebook closed when she heard Tony, her eyes wide. I'm sorry, what? Tony looked at the... Tony smiled at the look of being caught on the woman's face. Would you like another beer? She slid a basket of pretzels over. My name is Tony, by the way. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll take another. Why not? Do you have a name? Tony grabbed her glass and placed it onto the dishwasher bin before she turned and grabbed another. Or do I need to keep referring to you as the new brunette customer? 
Her full pink lips spread into a smile and Tony definitely didn't overlook the twinkle in her light brown eyes. Brittany, she said and nodded. Tony, hmm? Antoinette? She sighed, yes, passed on from my great grandmother. I was super happy to have such a unique name growing up. Brittany chuckled before she took a drink of her freshly delivered beer. She placed it on the coaster and Tony watched as she let her fingers slide down the chilled glass. She glanced back up to Brittany who was still watching her every move. What brings you to Swift Island? You a writer or something? She motioned to the notebook and Brittany's demeanor instantly changed. Oh yeah, um, no, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I am, I'm a journalist, but I'm just here trying to, uh, I don't know, figure things out, I guess. Hmm, Sound, so, uh, sounds like there's a story there. I guess you could say that. Brittany lifted her chin, pressed her lips together. Speaking of stories, what's yours? Ooh, smooth, very smooth. What? Brittany's laugh filled the space around them. I was only making conversation. Sure, Tony re replied with her own chuckle. She leaned against the bar top, bracing herself against the sturdy wood. My aunts own this place. She flipped the menu sitting in front of Brittany over and pointed to the picture of Leslie and Alice. Leslie's my mom's older sister and Alice is her wife. She smiled, recalling the memory of their love affair, proof that absence and time really do make the heart grow fonder. Now this starts with Brittany and she is uh, encounters Alice for the first time. Brittany walked the streets of her new temporary home to familiar, familiarize herself with her surroundings. People dipped in and out of the stores, excitedly giggling with their companions, while some walked quietly by themselves. She studied their faces, hoping to gain an inkling of familiarity, anything that would nudge her toward the visions that had, helped, had led her here. When she decided to come here, it was because she had an overwhelming sense of impending violence. She wasn't sure who was behind it or how, to, how she could stop it. She just knew it felt imperative. Now, as she wandered through the street, she considered again whether it was all in her head. She pinched the bridge of her nose. It was easy to recall the emotion she'd felt consume every nerve in her body. There's no way that was a hallucination. It was too real. But if the visions had led her here correctly, what was she supposed to do now? She sat down on a bench near the water to watch the tide change. She wasn't there long before she heard a woman curse loudly behind her. God damn it! Brittany turned to see an older woman kicking the wheel of a golf cart. Are you okay? She pointed to a piece of paper on the plastic windshield. Can you believe they gave me a parking ticket? I have a sign written right here that says it's okay to park. She pointed to a different piece of paper on the other side of the windshield. Brittany examined the second piece of paper. It looks like you wrote that. Well, I did, and they still had the nerve to give me a ticket. Brittany laughed. I'm not sure that defense will hold up in court. The woman threw her hands up. Well, it should. She looked up and down the street. I bet it was George. He's always been my least favorite. It's not like he doesn't know where to find me if needed to be moved. Patrols this place like it's the streets of Boston. Brittany couldn't pinpoint if it was her antics or the way she smiled, but she instantly liked this woman. I'm Brittany, by the way. It's nice to meet you. Oh, I'm already aware of the new girl in town. I saw you at my pub, the second wave. It's nice to meet you, officially. I'm Alice. She shook Brittany's hand. I thought you looked familiar. Brittany shook her finger at her. You're on the menu. Alice wiggle, wiggle, wiggled her eyebrows. I may be a little too old for you. Oh, I didn't mean like, I know what you meant, sweetie. Just, just let me have this. Alice winked at her. I saw you sitting in a bar a little while ago. It looked like you even made a friend. Brittany thought back to Tony, who'd immediately thrown her off her game. I'm not sure what she thought of me. It was nice to talk to her, though. Alice pointed toward the bar. Tony is as sweet as they come. I'll have to keep that in mind. Thanks. Alice stepped closer and seemed to inspect Brittany's biceps, squeezing one of them. Those things work on power tools? Well, I've been known to knock down a few walls in my time. Perfect. Alice pulled a pen from her pocket, plucked the parking ticket from her windshield, and scribbled on the back. Be at our house on Saturday morning at eight. We have a few things we could really use help fixing. I'll feed you, water you, and give you free drinks at the pub. Deal? Brittany nodded as she received the ticket, overwhelmed by Alice's boisterous spirit. Had she just been steamrolled into helping with a home improvement project? She thought of declining, but changed her mind. Maybe it would be beneficial to search, to, beneficial to her search to get to know some of the locals. I'll be there. And that's it for now. I could go on and on. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. If we can grab um, Jean and Jackie back too for a quick question. That was great reading, Erin. 
I understand why they picked you because I don't know anyone else who could say yeah six times in a row so convincingly. So, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> great job, Erin. Um, okay, so this book is quite unique. Um, not just that it's written um, by the three of you, but that you're using characters from your previous um, individual novels. So my question for you guys, and anyone can take this, is how did you come up with that idea? for this book? Where did this idea come from? Vodka. <laughs> yeah, vodka. <laughs> That's where all our great ideas come from. <laughs> I'd ask you to elaborate, but I'm not sure where that's going to go. <laughs> yeah, Jackie, do you want to take it or? Yeah, so um, I had gotten, we took characters from stories that we had gotten requests from from readers that wanted to see in continuation um, of a storyline. So Brittany from Land's End uh, played a secondary character. Tony from Breaking Down Her Walls played a secondary character. And then Jean's, um, Allison Leslie from her first novel, uh, The Second Wave, um, were beloved by her fans too. And um, when we were at GCLS in 2019, we had actually discussed um, writing a book together and incorporating the three of them, but we wanted to kind of venture into a genre that none of, the, none of us had really done before. Um, so uh, even though this is kind of a, a combination of a, a thriller and an occult, which we've dabbled in, I mean, I write you know, military and um, a little bit on the thriller side. Uh, Jean and Aaron typically write in contemporary romance. Jean and I had done a paranormal book together. So we kind of decided to head down a road that uh, the three of us had had never experienced individually. And um, the result was Swift Vengeance where uh, one of the characters has a near death experience that forces her into a situation where she's experiencing some psychic abilities and a killer's on the loose. And um, we made Tony uh, related to <laughs> Jean's characters so that we could uh, keep, keep them all in there. And um, Tony and Le or Leslie and Alice had such, you know, fun personalities and they were, they were so funny that we, we figured that they would just be a nice offset to kind of um, Tony's, default mechanism to being a bit neurotic so we thought they'd be a good balance to her and then Brittany who in Land's End was kind of cocky and kind of a playboy um had an experience that knocked her flat and she had to kind of reevaluate her whole life so it was it was a growing it was a way to help the characters grow also individually from the stories that they had originated from too Awesome. I love it. Well, thank you. But vodka is the short answer. Too long in a rain vodka was. <laughs> <laughs> There's just a bit of writing advice for everybody. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we have VK Pal. Thank you. There she is. VK. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your June release and you can start reading whenever you're ready. Okay, um, I'm going to be reading today from my June release, which is called When in Doubt. The two main characters are Jerry Wilder, who's a beat cop and is busy going about her day, enjoying her life, paying for her family home and trying to find the love of her life when she goes on a call at a drug house one night and her world gets turned upside down. The second character is Simone Sullivan, who is a psychologist, and she's busy trying to keep her historic apartment building from being demolished or redeveloped. I'm gonna read from the meeting scene where Jerry answers a call at Simone's condo. From her penthouse in the Madison building, Simone Sullivan inhaled the heady odor of gasoline. She'd called the police about a prowler but hadn't expected an episode of cops to unfold outside her window. An officer burst through a stand of Leyland Cypress next door, curled himself into a projectile and charged the trespasser head first. In seconds, he had the man handcuffed and then did a little victory dance. She was still at the window when her buzzer sounded and she rushed to answer, yes? This is Officer Wilder, did you call? Simone smiled at the sound of a sultry female voice 
I'll be right down. She changed from pajamas to jeans and a V-neck sweater before taking the stairs two at a time. Maybe watching the arrest spiked her adrenaline as well, or was it the realization that a woman had come to her rescue? Seriously, Sullivan, she reprimanded herself for succumbing to a stereotype and took a breath before opening the stairwell door to the lobby. Officer Wilder, I'm Simone Sullivan. She offered her hand and gazed into bluish gray eyes that swept her body before making contact. Simone shivered when their palms met. Are you okay, Miss Sullivan? You have such warm hands. Mine are usually so cold. She stepped back, sorry, I tend to be blunt, professional habit, but you have questions, shall we? She motioned toward a two-seater bench in the entryway and Officer Wilder waited until she sat. Bonus points for chivalry. Can you tell me what happened tonight? Wilder's leg pressed against hers was hot and muscled and Simone started to shift, but settled into the contact instead. When she did, the tightness along Officer Wilder's thigh eased as well. I was ready for bed and heard a man's voice from the courtyard below. Sound carries around here funneled off the houses and overpass like a wind tunnel. He was ranting and mumbling, nothing I understood. When he moved closer to the building out of sight, I called. I didn't know what he was doing until I smelled gas. He was going to torch the place. It wasn't a question. She just didn't understand why. And why was an important part of her makeup. No idea what would motivate someone to burn down the building? Simone shook her head. We've had some vandalism the past few months. Mostly a graffiti artist tagging the side of the building, nothing serious. Officer Wilder placed her hand over Simone's. Don't worry. Arson is usually a crime with a specific motive. We'll get to the bottom of it. Simone rolled her hand over and squeezed Wilder's fingers. It wasn't professional for either of them, but she didn't care. As capable as she was, having someone douse her home in gasoline rattled her. Thank you. You've been very kind, Officer Wilder. Jerry, we're holding hands, so you should at least know my first name. She smiled and the blue of her eyes deepened. Jerry started to say something else, but the store stairwell door opened and Mrs. Roberts and her Boston Terrier headed toward the exit. What's going on, Simone? Are we safe? Of course, Ms. Roberts. I smell gas, are you sure? Ms. Roberts picked up her dog and cradled her in a protective hug. Jerry rose, rose from the bench and approached them. Is it okay if I pet your dog? When the woman nodded, Jerry stroked the animal behind her ears and cooed soothingly before addressing Ms. Roberts. You're perfectly safe, ma'am, trust me. The puppy wriggled in the woman's arms. Guess we better go for that walk before it's too late then. Not every officer would have taken the time to reassure Ms. Roberts and pet her dog. That was very nice of you, Simone said. What can I say? Dogs bring out the best in me. Jerry's cell buzzed and she dug it from her pants pocket. Excuse me. She glanced at the message and the lines around her mouth tightened. I have to go process the suspect. She reached into her pocket and pulled out a business card. The incident number is on the back if you need a copy of the report. Jerry turned and headed for the door. Simone should let her leave, but something stopped her. Imaginary red flags popped up all over Jerry's body. Cop waved above her head, warning of the police mentality and blue line thing. Low pay peeked from her back pocket. Weird hours preceded her to the front door and a promiscuous bright crimson tag flapped comically at her crotch Add the chorus of family and friends yelling, don't do it. And Simone stifled the invitation on the tip of her tongue. Jerry paused at the front door and looked back. I don't usually do this, but would you like to have coffee sometime, Miss Sullivan? I mean, after work one day, if you're not busy or attached. The red flags vanished. Simone smiled at the touch of color on Jerry's cheeks and the flutter of her own heart. I'd like that very much. I have a soft spot for dog lovers. Jerry winked, lucky me, I'll text you soon. Simone, pulse hammering, rushed to the window and watched Jerry swagger back to her car. Oh my. I love that. I love, we're holding hands, so you should know my first name. Right. <laughs> 
have to use that sometime. I don't know how I'm going to work that in, but I'm going to have to find Quiet. some way. <laughs> Um, so as some readers will know, um, you had a career, um, in the police force. I don't want to say your rank cause I'm going to get it wrong. Um, but, <laughs> um, so my question for you is how much of, um, this book and all your books that, um, involve the police force, how much is fiction and how much is based on, you know, your knowledge and your experience? Well, most of the, uh, technical stuff, of course, is is very real and I try to make it real. As a matter of fact, for this particular one, I did a ride along because I hadn't, you know, I've been retired for quite some time and I wanted to make sure that I got all the details of the technical stuff and the procedural things right. So I did a ride along with an officer for a night. And uh, so I try to get those things right. And I do have a tendency to kill off some of my old nemesis from the department. <laughs> It's just easier that way. <laughs> I feel like life would be in general, right? Yes. If you could just do this, right? Right. Awesome. So what was it like doing the ride along um, after, you know, a few years in retirement um, and kind of going back for a night? Was it fun or was it like, oh, thank God I left? Or It was a combination of all of that. And the realization that the basic job and what you're there to do and how you do it hasn't really changed a lot. And that can be good and bad in some ways, but yeah, the technology was the thing that it changed most, obviously, because that, it's changed that much in the world. But yeah, everything yeah. was very similar, and I was very glad I'm not still there. <laughs> awesome. Stick to writing books. Yes, exactly. All righty. Next up, we have C.F. Frizzell, who's going to read from her June release, hopefully. So Frizz's book is called Measure of Devotion, and I'm going to let her introduce it to you, and you can start reading whenever you like. Thank you, Sandy. This is Measure of Devotion. Uh, it comes out June 1st. It's primarily Civil War oriented, um, based on a, a trip we went to GCLS in 2019, took a side trip vacation to uh, to Gettysburg and everything opened up after that. It was a story that I guess had to be told. You see something that just, a seed is planted and then there's just no getting away from it. It had to be written. Um, it's uh, about uh, a woman who takes on her twin brother's identity. He's passed away and she becomes, she enlists in his stead and she enjoy, uh, is a member of the Massachusetts Volunteers. And there's the other woman, the main character is Sophie Bauer and um, she's a farmer's daughter in Gettysburg. They each decide to tackle the war in their own ways for their own purposes, but uh, they meet as, well, let me read this to you. This kind of puts it in a nutshell. Uh, measure devotion is a story of two women determined to live as they choose and who find each other amidst the horrors of the Civil War. Catherine Sampson has been a soldier for more than a year, disguised as her late twin brother, Private Cooper Sampson. Sophie Bauer is a Ladies Aid Society volunteer from Gettysburg. This scene that I'm going to read uh, follows the Battle of Fredericksburg um, which is in December of 1862. And now the dear friends, Cooper and Sophie, are meeting on Christmas night before Sophie's volunteer group goes back home. The attraction between them tests Cooper's secret that she must hold. And it also deepens Sophie's confusion. The Ladies' Aid Society camp appeared deserted, but especially tidy. And Coop sensed it was prepared for tomorrow's departure. The thought weighed upon her spirit. She jumped to her feet when Sophie emerged from the wagon, angelic in a crimson dress Coop had never seen before. An evergreen shawl provided the perfect backdrop to the glimmering hair that cascaded over her shoulders. 
Coop caught her jaw dropping and cleared excitement from her throat. She absently ran her palms down the front of her frock, hoping the effort she had lent her uniform showed that her buttons and her buckles shone and that she had mended tears in her frock in decent fashion. You are a Christmas angel, Miss Sophie Bauer. You flatter me, Private Sampson. Sophie reached for Coop's hands, drew them to her bosom, and heat raised so fast to Coop's head she thought she would faint. You deserve it and so much more, Sophie. You're so many complimentary words came to mind, Coop couldn't choose one. You're lovely beyond words, and I'm beyond honored. And I'm so very happy you could come. Sophie led Coop around the wagon to a three-walled tent where a small table sat with place settings for two. I've made a supper for us that I hope you'll enjoy. Supper? Coop took in the porcelain plates and cups the white napkins, the tiny bowls of apple butter, salt, and pepper. Look at all this, it's spectacular. You did all this for, for us? I most certainly did. We Gettysburg ladies are quite resourceful. A bottle of wine in one hand, Sophie slid the cups across the table. Now, if you'd please pour, I'll fetch our supper. And with a cute little grin, she was gone. Coop hurried out of her knapsack and set it aside. None of this seemed real. By flickering lantern light, she poured the wine. Where did all this come from? And where are the other ladies? Obviously, Sophie had gone to considerable lengths. Coop couldn't help but to believe that the attraction she felt was mutual. And that sent a tremor of apprehension through her. How dishonorable am I? Sophie set a cast iron pot on a stump nearby and removed the lid and sent steam and aroma floating over their table, flooding Coop's senses. Sophie spooned plump biscuits out of the pot and set two on each plate, then added scoops of chicken, potatoes, onions, carrots, turnips, all in this lusciously thick gravy. Coop knew she gawked and tried not to drool. Not only had she not seen such a meal in ages, never had one, had one been prepared for her to share intimately with another woman. Finally, Sophie joined her beaming across the table, a vision Coop believed stolen from her personal fantasy. I, I can't begin to thank you, Sophie. You are an amazing woman. Hush now. This was a joy for me, Coop. I wanted to make your Christmas special and this was something I could do. All this, well, it's no easy feat. And I raise a toast to you. You've made this a very special Christmas for us both. She lifted her cup and Sophie set hers against it. And I raise a toast to you for your selfless friendship. Despite all a soldier endures, you've helped, helped me cope with some extremely difficult times. Well, it's worked both ways, Coop said. Well, it's what friends do, Sophie replied, and they drank. Now, don't you dare let this, me this meal get cold, eat. Coop took her time, but devoured the feast with serious intent. Conscious of her manners, yet all too aware of how Sophie expected a famished soldier should behave. Throughout, however, the lantern lit vision opposite her begged her attention. I see that it looks like your group is prepared to leave tomorrow. We're ready, yes. Sophie's eating slowed and she poked at her food. Everyone's eager to return to family. I'm sure. Do you think you'll be back? Hoping to disguise her longing, Coop waved her cup toward the wagon and winked before taking a sip. I mean, how could all this ever lose its appeal? Believe it or not, there's a great deal that I'll miss. And knowing that the war is still being fought while we're at home, well, I'm happy that things will return to normal for you, Sophie, but you'll be sorely missed. When the need arises, another group will take our place, I'm sure. No one could take your place, Sophie. Sophie set her fork down and dabbed at her mouth with her napkin. Her silken complexion darkened in a blush. You were very sweet to say. Coop slid her cup against Sophie's. I'll miss you. I'll miss your gay spirit, your kindness. You're an inspiration, Sophie. Forgive me, but... You are as beautiful inside as out. Hush, please. 
Oh, how I miss you too. Sophie wrapped her fingers around Coops on the cup. I confess that through all our travails thus far, through the harrowing and the tragic, I have never been as touched by a soldier as I have by you. Our acquaintance has been so unexpected, so remarkable to me, and I treasure it deeply. You, Private Sampson, just might be the most thoughtful, the most honorable person I've ever met. Coop swallowed hard against the dishonor in her throat. She asked, do you think we'll meet again? Sophie's twinkling eyes fluttered closed and she sat back in the chair. I suppose it is unlikely, isn't it? Oh, that's so sweet and so sad and now I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I've got all these feelings. I don't know what I feel right now. Um, so my question for you is, and you, um, this is not your first historical novel, and I know that you love research, unlike me. Um, so what is the most interesting thing that you discovered in your research for this book? Oh my God, the most Sorry. interesting. Sorry. That's tough. You can just pick anything, really. We uh, won't know if it's the most interesting. So I think... <laughs> The, um, I think having physically gone to the battlefield, the Gettysburg battlefield to be, I mean, we can all create our little scenarios when we, you know, we, we write a story, we, you know, our imagination goes wild. We create an elaborate island getaway or, or a, um, a, a ultra modern living room setting or bedroom setting. It's an, an imagination that, you know, your imagination takes hold, but when you step into something that's real, it's, it's almost surreal because you've like stepped into your, stepped into your imagination. Mm -hmm. This is what you're going to use to stand on the site where things actually happen that you're going to write about um, is kind of far out <laughs> to coin an old phrase. Um, anyone can stand there too. Yeah. And experience the same thing um so it's it's like come step step into the novel right about there um because this is exactly what you'll see right now yeah um, that's cool and i think that the history as you mentioned in that sense of history um but also being able to kind of introduce new characters and new storylines into that historical context is like the best of both worlds so that's cool thank you Thank right. you. All right. Next up, we have Kristen Kepler and Alyssa Bonney. Hopefully I pronounced those correctly. Um, they are reading from their June release, Wasteland. Um, and this is your debut novel with BSB. And it's also the first book of a series. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about the book and the series and start reading whenever you're ready. Um, okay, so Wasteland, this is, this is our book, Wasteland. Um, it's a dystopian war novel. It takes place in the Badlands, um, which is now known as the Wasteland in our setting. Uh, the two sides of the war consist of the resistance and the new military regime known as the National Armed Forces. Uh, the story follows two character perspectives, Danny and Kate, and the chapters alternate between them. Uh, Danny is a retired resistance fighter, and Kate is the general's daughter and an officer in the National Armed Forces. And um, that's basically the setting of the first book, uh, Two Sides of the War. Um, and the scene that uh, Alyssa's going to read um, takes place after Kate and the remainder of her unit are taken prisoner by Danny and the small town she's kind of been living in lately, uh, retired. And uh, Danny knows exactly who Kate is, but Kate has no idea she's being held by the infamous Danielle Clark. And uh, the, the scene that Alyssa is gonna read is told from it's Kate's perspective. So take it away, sweetheart. <laughs> I look at the shotgun in her lap and then back to her eyes. Mind pointing that someplace else? I don't appreciate barrels aimed at my face in the middle of a conversation. She looks at the boomstick as if she's surprised to see it pointing in my direction so casually. Oh, this? She picks it up and pulls back the action bar. It's not loaded. 
She bends the barrels forward and shows me the empty chamber. The hint of a smile on her lips is starting to annoy me. I want nothing more than to slap it off her face. She watches in amusement as I close the distance between us as far as my restraints will allow. There's a slight tug around my ankle preventing me from reaching her, but now I'm only a few feet away. She remains perched on the desk, unmoving and unfazed. I cross my arms. You're part of the resistance. She shakes her head. I'm not part of anything, which would explain why you let those raiders slaughter us. She shrugs. Wasn't really my fight. The way she says it, so blasé. It infuriates me. I take a forceful step, the chain keeping me from advancing any farther. Then why not let them finish us? She arches an eyebrow. You were the ones heading in this direction. Do you want to tell me how you ended up on my doorstep? I don't respond. Do you want to know what I think? She continues. I think you were part of a convoy. The new general got impatient and pushed out west without doing her homework. I think she's setting up bases faster than she can handle. So fast, in fact, that she didn't even wait to update the technology to accommodate life out in the wasteland. You got swept up in the sandstorms and you weren't prepared. You got turned around and lost most of your unit, either in the storms or from attacks, probably both. Then you saw our town and saw a chance to rest and invoke military privilege. And you were attacked along the way and you were unprepared for that too. I still say nothing. She's frustratingly intuitive and predictably arrogant. But you're wrong about one thing. We didn't let those raiders slaughter you. We intercepted and good thing too. She runs her eyes up and down my body and I shift uncomfortably because by the looks of it, you would have all been picked off before nightfall. Where's the humanity in that? I laugh, it's bitter and humorless and I barely recognize it as my own. So you're really just saving our lives, is that it? Our saviors, we should be grateful to you, thanking you, pretty much. I clench my fists at my side. Those people you let die, they weren't just my soldiers, they had families. Some of them were my friends. She drops both feet on the floor and stands. Maybe you should choose your friends more wisely, she whispers and walks to the door. I throw my hands in the air, frustrated. What the hell is your problem? We did nothing to you. We're not your enemy. We didn't attack you. All we wanted was to regroup and be on our way. She spins and takes five quick steps in my direction until she's almost pressed against me. I inhale sharply at her proximity. She's close enough that I can smell her clean, recently washed scent close enough that I can see the spark of hatred in her gray eyes. Is that why you let that village burn? Is that why you let them die? I could reach out and strike her, but I don't. I don't even know what she's talking about. We didn't let any village burn. Right. She drags her eyes down my body again before turning to leave, her shotgun resting easily across her shoulder. And you're wrong. You are the enemy. Simon was right, you know. I say to her back. She reaches for the door handle, but comes to a halt. If we don't return, they'll come looking for us. And not a scouting party either. It'll be that battalion you were so worried about. When they find us, and they will find us, they'll burn your precious little town to the ground because that's the law for harboring the resistance, even if you did provide food and quarter. Slowly, she turns. Her eyes bore into mine unwavering then you had better hope you're not in it when it burns to the ground. Her expression is icy as she opens the door and leaves. It closes quietly behind her and the lock clicks. I run a hand through my hair out of habit, annoyed and exhausted. My theory that she's resistance may have just been proven, but the small victory does nothing to quiet my anger. I wanna rip the chain from my ankle and leave this godforsaken town and forget my marching orders I want to go check on my best friend and the others in the medical facility. I want a shower and a fresh set of clothes. I want to clean my goddamn hands. But most of all, I want to know who the hell is she? Good job. <laughs> She's so mean, but so sexy at the same time. We'll let you guys pull that off. All right. So this is another book with multiple authors. And my question for you guys is, as obviously different people with separate households, and you both have kids too, right, I think? 
Yeah. So what's your process? What's your writing process? How do you guys um, write a book together when you live apart, different lives? Um, how does that work? Well, um, we talk all the time, all the time. Um, we, we usually talk about what, what we want to happen in the book. Um, where we want to go. We work on the outline together. And um, if, if I have more time during the day or whenever I will, I will start writing and we save it in a, a shared folder. So then she can pop in and add to it, uh, delete sometimes, you know, um, but we, we share a folder and we talk all day and we just are constantly, whenever we find time, we just go in so like this week, we'll say, oh, I'm going to work on this chapter. And she's, I'm going to go through this chapter. <laughs> but we, we both know where we're going with the story and, and how it's going to progress. So just whenever we find time, we just jump in that shared folder and work. Cool. We, and we have um, different strengths in different areas too, which I think work really well. Kristen is amazing at writing dialogue. Um, and I feel like I'm better at kind of filling in the after the dialogue stuff, the the descriptions and the movements and all of that so yeah I think that's that's true for a lot of writing groups is that the people often have their own strengths one person is really good at character one person is really good at plot um and as you said dialogue and setting and whatnot so cool that's exciting um and you have another book on the horizon so super quick um tell us a little bit about book two book two um is bigger than book one. It has more of everything. It has more romance, more action, um, more fighting, more suspense. It's, it's, I, I, I can't give away how the first book ends, but it picks up exactly where the, right after the first book ends and just pff, takes it from there. So, or we're really excited about it. The manuscript's pretty much done. So um, it's just bigger and bolder than Wasteland. That's good. I love it. All righty. So last but certainly not least, we have Amanda Radley, who I chose to go last so we can all enjoy her British accent. Um, oh, thanks, Andy. Like the joke is so old now. Every time I'm on a Zoom. Every time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is, is this only your second book with us it is yeah yeah because 400 but i think it's only number two yeah it's the well, second one to come out but i think i can't even i can't even count which one we're actually working on in the background so yeah it's the second one that's actually going to be released under her influence after detour to love awesome all right tell us a little bit about it and start reading whenever you like will do okay so under her influence is a story about beth fraser and she's the owner of a really popular theme park located in Scotland called the Fraser Park Resort. And Beth has no idea what a social media influencer is until her brother in invites one, Gemma Johnson, to the resort. And Gemma's a travel vlogger, an influencer, and lover of all things to do with theme parks and spends all of her time jet setting around the world and documenting her experiences. So in this scene I'm about to read, Beth has had a really, really bad meeting one morning and she's really depressed and she bumps into Gemma, who encourages the workaholic to spend some time with her at the nearby nature reserve. They both leaned on the handrail, coffees in hand, and looked at the waterfall in front of them. So, do you come here often? Gemma asked. Beth chuckled, not as often as I'd like. Gemma bit her lip and wondered how far she should push. She wasn't friends with Beth. In fact, she was an influencer who Beth might view as a sneaky journalist looking for a scoop. If there was a chance she could get Beth to confide in her, then she'd try it. Beth's beautiful face had gradually become more troubled each time Gemma had saw her lately. And if she could help in any way, then she would. So this list of people I need to karate chop, Gemma asked playfully. Beth smiled. I shouldn't have said that, I'm sorry. Don't be sorry, you look like someone had taken away your birthday. I'm sorry you're having a bad morning. Gemma took a sip of coffee, silently hoping that Beth would take the bait and start to open up about whatever weight was resting on her shoulders. It's just business things, Beth admitted softly. I thought it was because you were a renowned party pooper, Gemma joked. 
Beth smiled at her. Well, some would definitely agree with you on that. Party poopers don't share the best view in the nature reserve with someone else, Gemma said, gesturing to the secluded path they were on. I doubt anyone else would want to share this view with me, Beth mused. Their loss. Gemma didn't say if she meant the company or the view, but in her heart, she knew they could be standing in front of the rhino enclosure, complete with that interesting smell, and a keeper shoveling excrement, and she'd still have a light feeling in her heart if she had Beth beside her. We have a hostile board, Beth confessed. Gemma sort of knew that wasn't good news, but also had no idea what it actually meant. Board? I thought you and Cameron owned the resort. In name only. Beth sipped her latte and turned to face Gemma. The resort was falling behind the competition. We wanted to make it bigger and better, and for that we needed investment, lots of it. At first we found local investors, people who knew us in the resort, but then we needed more investment for the water park that's being constructed. Gemma had seen signs for the water park, but had no idea how far along it was. And some of those investors are hostile, Gemma asked. Beth nodded. Possibly. We lost one of our older board members a while ago, which meant a shift in power. Cameron and I still have the numbers, but they only need to turn one of the original investors and they can vote against us. Or call for a vote of no confidence in one of us, thus making our vote completely void. They seem to be targeting me to try to turn the votes. Gemma felt outraged on Beth's behalf. That's not fair. Beth smiled softly. Well, that's business. But why would they do that? The resort's great. What does it achieve to backstab you? Money, Beth stated simply. They can choose to change the way the park is run and they can make it more profitable. I'm a thorn in their side. I like things to be done right. And when things are done right, they generally cost more. Gemma suddenly had a very strong suspicion that Beth was the reason behind the exceptional level of detail at Fraser Resort. The theme that wasn't absolutely necessary but meant everything to the fans was the heart and soul of the resort was created by the woman in front of her. No wonder Gemma had been attracted to her. They both shared a passion for the magic of a tourist attraction done very well. What's your brother doing during all of this? Gemma asked, not even attempting to hide her frustrated tone. It was clear that Beth was taken on too much and with little or possibly no support at all. No wonder Beth had had trouble relaxing at the spa the previous day. Well, he does his best, but Cameron is more of a people person, Beth explained. He can relate to people better than I can, and if there's ever a problem in the park with guests or staff, he can always smooth it over better than me. I think he has some special magical twinkle in his eye or something. I'm sure you have that too, Gemma said. She forced herself not to look at Beth's eyes because she knew she'd get lost if she did. What's your favourite snack in the park? My favourite snack, Beth asked in confusion. It's something I ask everyone, Gemma explained, and I'm meant to be making you feel better about your hostile board and not making you dwell on it. Oh, um, I'm not sure. I suppose if I had to choose one, then it would be popcorn. Gemma slowly turned her head and glared at Beth. Popcorn. That's it. Just plain old popcorn. Beth laughed. Yes, just plain old popcorn. But it's not plain popcorn when you think about it. Not at all. It's the smell that first greets you when you come to the park in the morning. It wafts around most of the resort. It's fresh, warm, buttery, perfectly seasoned. It's never burnt, never under or overcooked. It comes in a box that's thick enough to keep its shape when thin. Sorry, shape, but thin enough to warm your fingers on a chilly morning. It's shareable and you always want more. It's never plain. It might not be fashionable or a freak shake or an ice cream mega concoction, but it's never plain. And with that one sentence, Gemma's crush on Beth developed beyond merely thinking that she was a confident and attractive woman. Now she was poetic and wise and really understood the emotions of a theme park in exactly the same way that Gemma did. Gemma smiled wistfully. You know, I hadn't thought of it like that, but you're right. Popcorn can only be the real answer. Unfortunately, because of the Instagram ability of your amazing snacks, I have a day of eating myself sick on ice cream ahead of me. Is that a word? Beth asked with a lopsided grin. Absolutely. Well, I would apologise for the Instagram or what's it of said snacks, but if they get more guests in the park, then I'm afraid I can't. You'll simply have to eat them all and enjoy every single one of them. Gemma laughed. I'll certainly do my best. Okay, you guys, we are never having this over dinner time again. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> also, I was laughing to myself as you were reading because Beth is so much like a rad. I'm listening to you read like with the, you know, everything has to be done right. And favorite snack is popcorn. 
And now we need to open a theme park, clearly. I mean. Yeah. Oh, I'm there. I'm there for that. Let's do it. Um, so I know that, um, I know that Fraser Park is a very um, special place in this book and a special place to you, um, but readers may not know that. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about this setting um, and why it is so special? Okay, well, Fraser Park is, um, it's a fictional place, but it is, it's borrowing heavily from um, a lot of theme parks around the world. So um, my wife's Swedish and um, we travel into Denmark quite a lot. And in Denmark is Tivoli, which is a very, very old sort of Victorian turn of the century uh, theme park. And it's not your typical kind of theme park. When you think of theme parks, lots of people think of roller coasters and things like that. But this is a historic, um, I'm gonna make you hungry again, popcorn lights, uh, tree lit boulevards, um, theatres and uh, peacocks running around uh, free. It's a, it's a very unique place to be. So it, uh, Fraser Park's heavily influenced by Tivoli, but also um, other places in the UK, like we have um, Alton Towers, which is a little bit more sort of on the extreme theme park side of things now, but there's the manor house and the old original cottages and things like that. So it's, um, it's basically sort of taken the Victorian essence of when they started to get leisure time and they would promenade in a park and those those parks grew up over time but a lot of them have a lot of very historical elements to them so that was what sort of drew me to creating Fraser Resort. That's awesome I love it and you should have led with the peacocks I mean I feel like yeah they are they are amazing but you can't eat your popcorn near them because they they will they'll just kill you basically. Oh, well, that's good to know. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's handy advice. <laughs> All right, if everyone can jump back on super fast, we have run over time. Um, Laura Carson, I am gonna ask um, your second graders question on the next panel. That's gonna be the opening question. Um, so please pop into that one um, for the answer because we are sadly out of time here for a 5 p.m. panel. And hopefully we will see you all again in a couple of minutes for our next panel. Thank you to all our authors.